Welcome to Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here is the podcast host, James Delling Pool. Hello, my delightful listeners. Delling Pool here, James Delling Pool. Can it be episode six already of my totally amazing podcast? It surely can. So here I am again, brought to you courtesy of Breitbart and Podcast One. And this week, as per usual, I have the most fascinating guest with whom we can while away the next hour very pleasantly. Our subject this week is foreign affairs. Specifically, is the world going to be a safer or more dangerous place under Donald Trump? Or is everything in such a mess it's not going to make the blindest bit of difference? To guide me through this minefield, there's this chap I met on Twitter called Charles Crawford. Charles is ex-British Foreign Office, a former ambassador to Bosnia, Serbia and Poland, no less. And the reason I settled on him is that, unlike most people in the Foreign Office, he appears not to be a raging pinko, hell-bent on selling his country's interests down the river at every turn. He's also, as you're about to discover, very bright, with lots of insights into this weird new world we inhabit. You can follow him on Twitter, at Charles Crawford, and you can read his thoughts on foreign affairs at his website, charlescrawford.biz. He's also written an excellent book on public speaking called Speeches for Leaders Leave Audiences Wanting More. I would go on, but I've just come back from the dentist and I'm feeling really depressed about my teeth. So instead, here he is, Charles Crawford on Dellingpole, brought to you by Breitbart News Network and Podcast One. Happy listening. Tell me, first of all, a bit about your background. You, you were at university with, with Tony Blair? Absolutely. I went to St Albans School. Uh, I went to Oxford in 19... I'm trying to think now, 1970. Two, and Tony Blair at St John's College was the year above me, but we were both in the law group. He was doing law, I was doing law. So we'd sit there in the law library pretending to study now and again. And um, I, re- I can't say I knew him very well because at that point, it's, it's um, student activism of the 60s reached Oxford in the early 70s. Yeah. And there was a big sit-in and so on. And there was a, the left with Tony Blair very quite prominent, I'd say, though as far as I can remember, he never joined anything. Some people were known to be Trotsky, some people were known to be communist, Dave Aronovich. I mean, these people were all there. Was David Aronovich there as well? Absolutely, yeah. All everyone was there. Okay. Benazir Bhutto. I mean, you know, a lot of people were there. That's what it was like. Um, But Tony Blair never seemed to be in any one faction, but he sat on the left side and perorated mightily on left-wing subjects. Right. And you were telling me about Doctor Who. Yeah, we all used to watch Doctor Who. I seem to remember it was on Saturday afternoons, and so uh, JCR, the common room in St John's, we'd all get together and watch Doctor Who, because at that point, um, St John's College was one of the big colleges, still is, and and it was was sort of had a bit, bit of a political run. So there were big JCR debates between sort of left and right. Um, of different shapes and sizes. The Vietnam War was going on. There were things happening. And so Doctor Who at that point had ran a story. I forget exactly what it was, whether it was the Cybermen or the Daleks or whatever it was, but there were workers up against terrible robot masters of some sort, overlords, and the workers were on strike. So half the JCR would be cheering the workers, viz Tony Blair and his side, and uh, maybe the other side, including me, would be cheering the oppressive bosses. Now, Charles, I'll be honest with you. This is one of the reasons I've chosen you to tell me about global affairs, because maybe I'm wrong and you can correct me here, but it's not the Foreign Office absolutely riddled with pinkos who are itching to sell their country down the river. And you seem to be um, a rare bastion of of soundness amid a sea of, of, of unsoundness. Well, you can say that. I, I, mean, I wouldn't. I think that's a bit of an unfair characterization of my dear colleagues. I think the thing about the Foreign Office is certainly when I was there, it's different now because it's sort of dissolving. I mean, I've written about this on the, in the Telegraph the other day, but because quite a lot of people now in the Foreign Office aren't from the Foreign Office, they're just seconded for other government departments. So the Foreign Office is in a very bad way, I think, philosophically and organisationally. But when I joined, it was. 
it still had adults in it, you know, people who'd served in the Second World War. What was odd about diversity agendas you see now yeah. is that when I joined, there were people wandering around with no legs. They were disabled because they'd fought in the Second World War and, you know, had lost things. And yet there was no special treatment for them. They got on with it. But it was, of course, you know, old fashioned in that sort of way then. And I suppose there were, it hadn't been long when I joined after the rule had been abolished that when women got married they had to leave the service so you know it was a different world the thing about the foreign office though they were it was difficult to get in it still is when i applied there were 10,000 graduates applying for about 10 places and 10,000 good graduates applying actually for about 20 places so it's a difficult procedure to get through and they're not looking for the the cleverest people even though a lot of clever people are applying they're looking for people who are sort of pragmatic Oh, I hate that word. Well, that's, I know. That's scary. Well, you might do, but you've got to. If you think about it, you've got to do a job where you might have to be, you know, in Syria at the moment. Then you might have to go to the UN. Then you might have to go to. Then you might have to go to Argentina. You need people who are adaptable and aren't going to be, um, you know, trying to make the world fit a certain schema. You have to be, in that sense, flexible. You can call it pragmatic is the wrong word, but certainly flexible. You just do need to have those people. And morally flexible as well, would you say? Well, I think we all have to be a bit morally flexible because, you know, you're dealing with people who may, might profoundly disagree with you. So you have to be, in some sense, able to tune into them. So I think going back to the question, the thing about the foreign office is they're incredibly loyal people, but they can't be much more sort of principled I think it's difficult to be more principled than the than the people giving them orders I mean let me give you a, a weird story I went over the Department of Transport in about 1985 because I was working on a bilateral air services issue to do with UK and America Freddie Laker Mrs Thatcher BA privatization it was a big big fuss and we're having the meeting there at the Department of Transport and about about sort of 20 past four there's a lot of noise in the corridor so I said, what's all that noise? I said, well, it's people going home. It's nearly five o'clock. I said, well, what happens if the minister wants something? They said, well, the minister's office can type it up themselves. Now, that was absolutely inconceivable in the foreign office. You know, you would wait politely until the minister had gone. Then you'd go, effectively. So the, the attitude of the foreign office is, was very, um, I mean, deferential to politicians. And so when you complain about the foreign office being full of wishy-washy you know, pinko, liberal, whatevers. That's partly because our politics is like that. You know, if you're looking at the Middle East, what do you want, guys? Do you want to sell masses of stuff to Arab countries or do you want to uphold Israel? Now, now the answer is you try and do a bit of both, but that means you end up, you know, very much on the one hand on the other. Isn't the Foreign Office, though, famously for uh, Arabist? I mean, the, uh, well, there are a lot of Arab countries and there aren't many if you're dealing with the There's Middle only East. One Israel. <laughs> Well, yeah, the only one is Israel. So you've actually got a lot of people who will, who when they go out in the evening, sit there at some dinner party somewhere in the Middle East, and all they get is an earful about how terrible Israel is, and that just starts to sort of. They go native. They, they, well, they don't go sheep's native. Sheep's eyeballs but, no, turns them. Well, you have sheep eyeballs in. Oh, we were offered those in Yugoslavia. I mean, it's not just it's not just that part of the world. I mean, it's just that it sort of adds up. So if you're having a meeting of senior people who know about the Middle East, there will be a lot of them there who have served in Arab countries and not so many who've served in Israel. That's just how it is. And ministers know perfectly well, you know, they've got to meet, you know, Arab ambassadors. There are more of them than the Israeli ambassador. Okay. So, so, so what I'm saying is, you know, you, you have to... You have to you know, and likewise, there are a lot of people who've served in Europe. I mean, they've, they've worked in Europe. They've, like me, they've worked on developing European integration. They're sort of, you know, impressed by the whole thing. Um, you know, those things add up. Cause so you, the Foreign Office is very Europhile because they've all been working in Europe and, and... Well, not necessarily. You've got to be careful. I mean, the Foreign Office would say... The Foreign Office. The Foreign Office people would tend to say, Minister, here, this is where we are. Successive governments, despite obvious Euroscepticism out there, you know, among the Delling Poles of this world and indeed the wider public and indeed my own family and indeed me have nonetheless successive governments have voted for this. You have voted. Mrs. Thatcher voted for Maastricht. You know, you voted for this. You voted for that. This is where we are now. If you want to change, please look at the costs of changing. And right. that, then all of a sudden, 
ministers think, nah, we've ended up here, maybe it is expensive to change. And now look at the headlines about Brexit. You know, how do we get from where we are to where we want to go next? It is difficult. I hear what you say, but in the papers <laughs> today, just sure. before I came to see you, there was a piece about yeah. Lord Carr. Kerr. Lord Kerr. Yeah. Um, who was former... He, he worked Permanent to... undersecretary, if it's him. Yeah, and he was ambassador to the EU at yeah, one, he's, one he's point. Yeah, he's a serious expert. And he made a speech, a somewhat inflammatory speech, yeah. I would say, where he suggested that the people, the British people, were basically thick because they voted Brexit, yeah. and that what they needed was a healthy influx of foreign blood to help dilute that stupidity. Well, that seems to me representative of a very particular and dangerous mindset. Well, I would agree. But I wouldn't say it's what everyone thinks or indeed what everyone did think. So, I mean, you would get people who just temperamentally, I mean, just talking about Oxford reminds me there was someone at Oxford who was a very, very annoying person. You know, there, you know, at college, there are people Tell who were, no, no, he wasn't annoying. He was flamboyant right. and, and he actually wasn't annoying. He was full of himself, but very confident. You know, his set, they had all, you know, his group. They were the sort of people who had girlfriends. They were the sort of people... They were public school boys, basically. Of course they, was, yeah. they were people who had cars or access to cars, and they would go off to London for the weekend wearing these sort of second-hand fur coats they'd bought in Oxfam. That was the sort of people he was with. But, they, but there were other people who... But he wasn't annoying. There were other people who were just nerdy little geeky guys, the sort of people who, you know, can recite train timetables, this sort of stuff. And I remember one of them was just one of the most annoying people one of the first jobs he got was in brussels you know this is back in the 70s because you know there you've got the chance to be annoying on a really big scale <laughs> so some people like though that procedure they like the haggling of the meetings they actually genuinely enjoy the the tag wrestling effectively thing where you sort of side with the germans then you flip over the french but then you come in with the italians some people like that like that work and of course the European Union was designed that way Absolutely. it was designed yeah, yeah. to be so boring yeah. that, that outsiders wouldn't understand its, its, yeah, its but, workings but I, don't, but I think you have to understand why that is and the answer to that is because you know why do you have lots of rules and the answer is because you don't have shared trust you don't have common values therefore you have to write everything down and, th and that's why it is so complicated, because in fact, Italians and Swedes and Brits and Belgians and, and Germans and so on, we're very different in the way we look at rules. So for everyone to be satisfied that no one is being cheated, you have to write it down. And that makes the whole thing fundamentally impenetrable to anyone except incredibly annoying people. So the great delusion at the heart of the European project is that we're all one big happy family. And yet it's actually the opposite is true, that we are all so different that... Well, I'm not saying... Yeah, I think the I would say that, well, I'm saying that it was set up f going right back after the Second World War. You know, we've had the First World War, the Second World War. Type in wars in Europe in Wikipedia, you get about five pages of wars in Europe. That was sort of bad. Every few years, people were going off to fight. So we've sort of stopped that. But the only way to do that, it seemed at the time, remember all this was set up, you know, a long time ago before the Internet. If you're doing it now, you might do it completely differently. You had to lay down all these rules. And um, and I think we are different. And I think in the end, that's why Brexit has happened and frankly why I voted for it, because it just somehow it, we just don't fit. We are different. We have a common law tradition. We're an island. We have a global view of things. We, you know, we like at least we used to like light touch regulation um so, so there's a sort of there was a sort of existential almost mismatch going on over the years between us and the european project now that doesn't mean we're not europeans you know you read your look on the shelf over there there's you know all the dickens books i mean you know how people from europe turn up in these dickens stories they just come in here without passports there weren't passports in those days you just arrived there was free movement of europeans there were scottish people going over to poland in the 1700s because they had no food because poland at that point was rich so these things ebb and flow down the centuries um so we are part of that european story all that's fine the question is what is the institutional intelligent modern basis for all that happening and so if you go on YouTube, you can see me giving a TED talk where I talk about the physics of diplomacy. Um, and this was in Poland, actually. And the argument is this, that over the years, 
there was... I mean, I start off by giving the formula for kinetic energy because my son went to university, did science, so I knew all about this, so I'd forgotten it. But f kinetic energy, the, the velocity of a moving car, is all about mass and velocity. Sorry, the energy of a moving car is all about mass and velocity. So it's quite easy to stop a car at 10 miles an hour. It's not so easy to stop a car at 60 miles an hour. That's kinetic energy for you. If I throw this chair at you, it'll hurt you. But if I shoot a ping pong ball at you from a high velocity rifle, it'll go straight through you. Because it has incredible velocity, but very low mass. So my argument was the world was built upon mass. Mass movements, weapons of mass destruction, heavy tanks, big, you know, factories. And that was how it was for three, four, five, six hundred years. All of a sudden, because of new technology, we're moving to a world of velocity, where fast-moving things, WikiLeaks, pirates, you know, migrants, whatever you want to call it, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, are moving faster than governments can cope with. And therefore, um, the structures built up in the age of mass... And the EU is a classic example, I said, of a thing that adds mass but reduces velocity. The bigger it gets, the slower it gets, whereas everything else in the world is speeding up. So, in fact, it's unsuited as a thing for modern times, and therefore it may end. This was my argument back in 2012 or so. Calling Quite you good. Nostradamus. Quite good. Yeah. But, it, but there's a sort of point there. So when you're going back to what diplomats think about all this, I mean, they're, you know, we sit there at dinner parties and in meetings sort of mulling all this over and it's very big stuff and and so i think you could be very very sort of anti-eu but nonetheless decide that it's better off for us to stick there on the bed of the devil you know argument yes or you could be quite cynical about the eu and actually say look it's going to be really expensive if we leave but i think we should which is sort of where i came down before we move on to um, the wider world, just tell me, do you think that uh, the Remainers are going to be able to sabotage Brexit? I mean, you, you, know, you know how the civil service operates. There seem to be various senior figures who are doing their damnedest, and, and, and of course the judiciary as well. The Supreme Court seems to be hell-bent on sabotaging it. Do you think that the civil service will undermine the democratic will of the British people? Uh, no, but reality may undermine the will of the British people because, you know, we have been in the European Union now since when? I mean, 40 years? Yeah. It's a long time. You know, really a lot of things have changed in that period, including things that go deep into our legal and constitutional systems. You know, for the average guy reading the newspaper, life goes on, he can, you know, he can hop on a plane, go to France. You know, all this seems quite smooth. You know, there are sort of advantages from it. But when you really look at what's happened constitutionally and legally, and just in terms of the way, you know, rules and regulations and laws are passed, like, you know, we're sitting on this chair, there are probably European safety standards on this chair, which mean that if you drop a cigarette on it, it won't blow up. Now, they may not all be European Union standards. Let me give you Mrs Crawford was worse than me when it came to Brexit, I have to say. I, my wife was too. She, she used to berate me over breakfast <laughs> for showing insufficient zeal in the, in the battle against the EU monster. Well, we had this bizarre moment when, we, when our second son was born. This is back in 1993. We went to John Lewis to buy... We were living in central London then. We went to John Lewis to buy a, a high chair. And we bought this high chair, and it was a nice, expensive John Lewis high chair, and it had wheels on the base of the high chair. And we had a kitchen where it was, you know, a sort of faux wood covering, so you could move this thing around easily. Unpack the high chair, assemble it, no wheels. So we go to the shop and say, why are there no wheels? It says on the box there are wheels, there are no wheels. They said, well, we're very sorry because there is a European directive that says this doesn't meet health and safety standards because the thing could shoot across the room, eject the kid, and he, the poor baby would fall on the gas and be blown up. I said, that is insane. That cannot possibly be the case that someone has stopped you selling this high chair with wheels. Anyway, I then wrote a memo to the Foreign Office, European Parliament, saying, you've got a real problem here. You've lost another supporter at home. Mrs Crawford is not happy with the EU because of this. And they said, well, actually, it's not the EU. It's the European Health and Safety Directorate set up under some sort of convention, blah, 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 blah. So 
you know, it's not just the EU. There's vast networks of things we now belong to because that's how the world works. You know, your uh, your podcast is going out to the planet because of partly because of the International Telecommunications Union who helped set up global standards for communication. So things work. Things don't just work because they work. They work because boring civil servants all the time, all around the world, are setting up compromises that work. And the EU actually is only one part of those compromises. You know, you've got the WTO, you've got all these World Trade Organizations. So there are great jungles of stuff out there, which even someone like me is only dimly aware of. So when you look at the whole thing, um, what was the question? I've forgotten. Um, we were talking about, <laughs> but, but your wife's special zeal for well, getting but, out of the EU and... and... Yeah, but you were, but I was basically trying to make the point that when you're an official... You, you said, will the civil service sabotage Brexit? Yes. The civil service are people who for 40 years, if you joined the civil service at the age of 20, you have literally spent your whole adult life processing all this stuff. Yeah. Why? Because successive governments have voted for it. The British people have never voted for a party that said, we are going to leave. And so you, the British people have got what they asked for. And on the whole, the British people have put up with it. Until, I, actually, I dispute that. Well, the British people would never really got what they asked for because they were never really consulted on it. Because well, the whole but they've had a lot the of elections. Union. They've had a lot of elections. Yeah, okay. And no party has campaigned on the basis of enough is enough, we're voting to leave. And the reason they didn't do that is because they thought they would lose. So yes. finally, you've had this Brexit vote, and that is now a big thing. So when you say, will the civil service, the judiciary, all these people sabotage it, I don't think they want to do that. I think people are quite loyal to the mission very loyal to mission but the problem is and you might blame david cameron for this if you really well, probably, wanted to blame yeah. someone it's always tempting to blame someone but i personally would put a bit of blame on him even though i live in his former constituency what is the plan what is the plan if we vote yes what is it we want do we want you know wto do we want eea do we want efta do we want nothing and what are the consequences of moving to each of these possible next stages? And what are the transaction costs of moving to them, even if you want to move to them? So I always look at a lot of issues like the Balkans or the EU. I look at it like this. Imagine you're at the bottom of a huge sand dune and you want to run to the top. So you run as hard as you can up the sand dune. It's very steep. And eventually you get to the point where it's hard to move because every you know you start to slide backwards. And then you're sort of poised, not sure where to go. And you look across to the right, over there is a very big, fat tuft of grass. And over to the left is some other big, fat tuft of grass. And if you'd seen them when you started running, you'd be in a much better place to get to the top. The point is, if you move sideways, you go downwards. <laughs> so you cannot get to those tufts of grass without starting all over again. So the EU issue, the Brexit issue, is a little bit like that. We can identify outcomes. We can identify what we might like at the top of the slope. But it's just not clear how you get there and what the transaction costs are of, you know, having trade disrupted in one way or the other for 10 years. That is genuinely a difficult problem. And if you're someone whose job it is in the civil service to think about employment prospects for people and you're worried that Nissan or Google or whatever it is will pull out of the UK, what are you meant to tell ministers? Ministers, if you carry on like this, there is a risk these people will leave. That may be true. And the minister doesn't want to get up and say... the ministers don't want to get up and say to the public listen public you wanted brexit you're going to lose jobs so what's striking about the current situation is that labor for their own bizarre if not grotesque reasons seem to be accepting everyone seems to have accepted it because they know damn well that if you campaigned on the basis that let's pretend it didn't happen that would not be popular so you have to deliver something that looks like brexit right but delivering that is genuinely not easy. I mean, it just isn't easy. I can tell you this as a fact. Whether you like it or not, it is not easy. So you have to come up with some sort of plan. And if you treat Brexit as something which is, say, a 15-year project as opposed to a six-month project, you get a very different view of it, which is why Flexit and all these other ideas are out there, which is you do it in stages because it is genuinely complicated to disentangle yourself from all this stuff and then re-entangle yourself with the sort of stuff that Australia and Singapore and Brazil have. Don't rush it, but have a clear methodology for working your way through it. And I think if you have that, the civil service and judiciary will fall into line. If you don't have that, the mice will start getting at the thing and create a mess. 
Right. That's enough depressing facts about, <laughs> about Europe, I think. I'm, I'm talking to former British ambassador Charles Crawford about, first of all, about the EU, and, and I'm going to talk to him in, this, in the next section about global affairs, global geopolitics, particularly to do with places like Syria, with Russia. Perhaps we'll go to the South China Sea. I don't know. You're listening to... Pole. Do you like scary radio dramas? Tune into Fangoria's Dread Time Stories, fully dramatized horror stories hosted by Malcolm McDowell. Irony is only one small ingredient of these Dread Time Stories. Hear a new episode every other week on the Podcast One app, iTunes, and PodcastOne.com. This is Pole. A Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Dellingpole. Welcome back to Dellingpole. I'm talking to my special guest, former diplomat Charles Crawford. Charles, you were telling me something while we were having coffee before we started this podcast um, about a talk you gave at your daughter's school about about borders and and. and I was very interested because what you were saying about borders seems to explain why the modern world is so confusing. Perhaps you could elaborate. <coughs> right, right. My talk at the school was called What If Borders Melt? <clears throat> and I started off by asking one of the girls there to go and turn the lights off. And she turned the lights off. And I said to some other girl, please, will you go and turn the lights back on? She turned the lights back on. So I said, right, girls, it's a girls' school. Why do we have lights? I mean, why do they work? And so you go through a whole series of rather obvious answers like because we need to see, blah, 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 and you start to get into what's going on below the surface of the light, as it were. And in the end, it boils down to because someone has invested in electricity, they've invested in the huge sums of money needed to build power stations. Why have they done that? Because they get money from us. Why do they get money from us? Because we get into trouble if we don't pay the bill. Why do we get into trouble if, if we don't pay the bill? Because... You know, the police will come and get us. Ah, where do the police come from? Well, the police come from the law. Right, where does the law come from? Now we've got to it. And the law comes from borders. And so if you drive across Europe, everyone says, but look at Europe, it doesn't have any borders. Europe has masses of borders. You drive from France into Belgium, and you have a traffic accident on both sides of the border. Different police people will show up. Different rules will show up. Different insurance arrangements will apply. Different witness standards will apply. Different rules of evidence, blah, blah, blah. These are legal borders. And they're incredibly important. They're what make the world work. And for most of human history, there weren't borders. There were there was sort of loyalty to kings and dukes. And, you know, look at Macbeth, you know, whoever killed the king, became the king, and then the other dukes would decide if they're going to be loyal to Macbeth. So that went on for a very long time and led to masses of wars. And so you had the idea of the, the sort of Westphalian order, the peace of Westphalia in the, in the 1600s, which sort of started to link leaders to defined territory. It created the idea of sovereignty. Sorry to bore everyone with this, but it's important. So the modern state has emerged from that. So what we now happens to us when we land at Heathrow and stand in a queue is a function of the modern state. And the modern state knows exactly down to the literally down to a centimetre where its rule begins and ends. That's just the thing. You can map it on Google. On the, you know, the, There are some parts of the world where the border of a country goes through someone's house. Because that's how it is. Lines on the map in Africa were drawn because you had to have borders. So a lot of, if you look at Syria, you look at Russia and Crimea, and you look at Mexico, and you look at the idea of the wall, you know, walls, you know, people in Hungary building a wall to stop Syrian migrants or whoever these migrants are coming into their country. It's all about trying to defend the modern state against reality. <laughs> and the reality is that people are now far harder to control. And so my big, you know cataclysmic if you like thesis is that you know we may not be going back to the 1930s we might be going back to the 1530s or are we going back to the 1330s not tomorrow but over a period of 100 years whereby whereby borders as we've come to understand them start to fray and you end up with something a bit like you had a hundred, few hundred years ago where you have very strong cities very strong local areas and weird no man's lands in the middle why shouldn't that happen? 
And Robert Kaplan wrote a good book about America, saying this is what he thought would happen to America over the next century. It's, you know, it would start to fray as a place because there are just too many pressures on those borders, and it's very hard to control them. Well, this is this is what they envisioned in 2000 AD in Judge Dredd. I think you get Mega City One. And yeah, sure, these. absolutely. But that is actually that might be reverting to the norm of human history. You know, maybe what we've City had states. well, but powerful spaces which are really controlled, um, and uh, but that control sort of fizzling out on the edges. On the borders where, yeah. where, where the wild people live. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. so, so if you know, I said to my, you know, my my daughter goes to a, a nice school, putting it mildly, and there are girls there from all over the world. Yeah. And they are taught at that school a sort of, as far as I can understand it from arguing with my daughter all the time, a sort of mushy internationalism. You know, they have to be, which is that we're all one, really. Uh, there's no real differences between people. We're all people. I mean, oh, that's quite attractive. You know, you, you can sort of see that. But on the other hand, if that school was only full of Chinese girls, it would be a completely different cultural thing. And if it was only full of English girls with no African girls and Chinese girls, it would be a completely different thing. So there are there are sort of identities we have which can be shared and they can be complex but they are nonetheless real and i said to them listen if you have a nice garden you have your school here if a whole lot of syrian migrants or african migrants or for that matter american migrants doesn't matter canadian migrants climb over the fence and start doing their thing on your field and you can't get the police to shoo them away at what point does that cease to become your field you know, it will become their field because ultimately what protects that field, what makes it yours is the law. And if the law no longer applies, then you've got serious problems. And that's why the issue of migration is so genuinely hard for people, because we like the idea of people moving around. We like to move around ourselves. But how do you control it in the modern world when there are people who may simply climb over the fence and not only that they are they have velocity they are armed with iphones and clever ways of networking which mean they can network and organize and go on facebook and set up roadblocks faster than the police can organize because they've got better technology that is a completely new thing in human history mm. Which probably which explains Trumpism because I was say, yeah. because then it explains what's happening in Europe. Everyone is saying, "But hang on, we're losing control," and you are actually losing control. This is actually a thing that's happening, and we in the UK happen to have a moat around our you know our castle, so that sort of limits the number of it makes it harder for people to get in a boat and paddle across the sea. But there are some people doing that, um, and so so I think you know we for most purposes control our borders uh, we have a wall you know a passport and a visa arrangement is a wall and i think this is why one reason why donald trump got elected and why you know i can have some sympathy with his policies because if you say some of his policies at least if you say listen anyone who gets into america can turn up in a sanctuary city and get a driving license and get benefits and get sort of help of some shape or other and we won't we won't enforce the law what you're really saying is that every sucker like me i'm going to america next week i have filled in the esther form i've paid 50 dollars for my esther form you know to go on holiday we're having a summer holiday i've played by the rules yeah the americans who are paying for the sanctuary cities have played by the rules what you're really doing is setting up an incredible moral hazard problem, which is anyone who plays by the rule, anyone who doesn't play by the rules, who just climbs over the fence and turns up, gets treated as some sort of hero. The modern state will not survive if that idea, you know, takes over. And in fact, people won't let it take over because they will get very angry and nationalistic and therefore everyone gets in a bad mood. So Trump is, in fact, very modern in a way. We, 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 we look at him as being, as being retrograde and, and nationalistic, but actually he's, he's seen the problem more clearly than perhaps well, he's conventional political leaders. Well, I think all political leaders see the problem. What they don't actually know, to be honest, is how to deal with it. It's one thing saying setting up a wall. Well, fine. What happens if they dig under the wall? You know, there are plenty of which walls. They will, and, which which they, they will, because there are walls. I mean, so, so I think if you were... a Coming back to me as a civil servant, if someone says to me, OK, you seem pretty bloody smart, says the minister, what should we do? 
I mean, I've written a lot on my website about this if anyone's interested. But, but, but what I think is this: in our country, we are an open trading country. We, you know, libertarian-minded, conservative-type people believe in the market. We believe in that. I think. I think that's pretty clear. And so we like, you know, we like footballers coming here to play. We like businessmen investing here. We like um, ships coming here. We like tourists coming here. We like a lot of people coming to our country. What we don't like is them staying around illegally. And and if they do stay around illegally, getting stuff. So my friend, who's a doctor, he was, he was a doctor, just left the health service, retired. And he was very, 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 very pro-Brexit. And he said, listen, you can have a welfare state, but you cannot have a welfare state with open borders because people turn up in the hospital. They simply cannot plan if they don't know how many people roughly are going to show up with broken legs. And if people are turning up in the health service wanting to have babies or to get serious diseases treated from anywhere in the world and they walk in and they get that for free, that is an unsustainable business model. So you have to have controls. And probably the answer is to have radical technology controls. So you come into the UK, they scan your eyeball. If you're, and if you are beyond your date in the UK for staying and you walk into a hospital and your eyeball doesn't match, you get no treatment unless you pay cash on the spot. So technology can solve a lot of the practical problems that arise from from the fact that we are an open society. But you've got to have the political will to enforce these regulations. You've got to have the political will to enforce Well, you've got to have the political will to bring them in. Uh, uh, but you've also got to have the technical capacity to enforce them. There is masses of regulations in this country about migration. You know, illegal immigrants are illegal. But then, <laughs> you know, there's no lack of lo laws and regulations. They sure not de facto. Well, I mean, but quite a lot of them, but quite a lot of them are deported. But there are lots of... There's a little industry out there of human rights lawyers getting money from the taxpayer to, you know, to pay for these people to have, you know, certain privileges, which you would argue they don't really deserve. And I'm not saying you should be horrible to people, but you've got to have rules, because if you don't have rules and you don't respect the rules, the state starts to collapse. And if the state starts to collapse, you get a very serious mess. So this is bad. Sometimes you have no choice but between bad options and much worse options. Mm. That's how it is. And the mobility and the, the freedom that the modern world gives all of us comes with certain consequences. And one of the consequences is it's genuinely harder to maintain control in a principled way. So how does the, the Muslim Umar fit in with this with this, with this borderless world? Well, I, I'm not an expert on Islam, but as far as I can understand it, you know, Islam you know, has the idea of a, a it, it doesn't really in a deep way accept the division between sort of law and religion and the state and religion. Islam is, is more of a encompassing idea than that. And, you know, Turkey has had a good run in trying to separate religion from the state and look what's happening there. It's sort of going back in a more religious direction. The state is somehow an expression of Islam in a, in a way that goes beyond um, the state being an expression of Christianity in the UK. You know, the Queen is head of the church and that sort of thing. But I don't think most of us think of the British state as an expression of Christianity. Maybe Muslims do, but I don't think most British people do. It's just there. So I think if you then start, if you have people coming into the country who have a very, you know, and they're absolutely fine, they're not... not I'm not saying everyone therefore is extremist, but if you have people coming into this country who have a different philosophical attitude to the state and what the state actually really is and what borders are and where loyalty lies, you start to have problems if if it gets if those numbers start to grow because they'll say, well, hang on, why can't we have our own courts and you believe in freedom? Why can't you let us do this? And what about this? And what about that? And And then you start to run the risk of of sort of not exactly no-go areas, but of areas where it's just easier to let things lie. Yeah. Well, we, we used to have this attitude in Britain to, to Catholics, didn't we? Yeah. We, we, we called absolutely. them ultramontane, which means their loyalties were over the mountains yeah, towards, towards the And you still the can't be a Catholic and be king, can you, or queen? And, and maybe, yeah. maybe the, the, there was some basis to that fear, but it seems to me that there is a much greater basis in our current concerns about, about Muslim populations in Britain which don't want to integrate, 
which see themselves as Muslims first and British citizens second. Well, I don't think, yeah, I mean, I just think, you know, to be fair, let's be fair, you have, there's, you know, it takes all sorts, and there are all sorts of different types of Muslim, and Bosnian Muslims, and Saudi Arabian Muslims, and Syrian Muslims, and Malaysian Muslims, you know, do believe different things, so let's not lump everyone in the same thing. I talked to a Labour woman MP, very old Labour woman MP, who, um, when she was out in Poland, and she was on a visit of some MPs and we were sitting chatting at supper and I said, you know, what's, what's going on in your constituency? And she started talking about the problem of women Muslims. And she'd replaced, I think, I think she'd won the seat from a, it was one of a, a sort of swing seat, but it was, I think she'd won it from a Conservative anyway. And what happened there was the Conservative MP would go and meet the Muslim community, as you, you know, called it. And all the men show up. And he chats to them and they all agree, everything's fine. And he goes away. She gets elected. She goes along to meet the Muslim community. She says, well, where are the women? I want to see a few of those, please. So when Muslim women start writing her letters, telling them about all the problems they've got and, you know, the sort of you know, the lack of freedom they have in some respects and uh, what they have to do and what they have to wear and who they can marry and the forced marriages all this sort of stuff which is going on in parts of that space she raises this with the labor hq in london they say leave it, it's too tricky so this is what i mean it's not that all the laws apply to everybody but it's 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 that all of a sudden it just gets a bit too difficult and you know and you, uh, you want to get these people to vote for you so just don't rock the boat so i think there is an issue genuine issue here about about loyalty and the modern world puts that on the table and and you know trumpism putinism wherever you look le penism brexit you know you can argue it's all about people getting uneasy about where loyalties really lie and how you enforce loyalties or how you can you maintain them not enforcing them even can you simply sustain them um you know, and let's be honest, if you look at world demographic trends, we're go you know, our, you, you know, you've got a daughter, I've got a daughter, their grandchildren will live in a different world. You know, Nigeria at the end of this century will be on track to be the second biggest country in the world. Closing in on China. Is that right? I yeah, didn't know well, that. You know, but go on the internet. Well, in, in population or yeah, population, yeah. Go on the internet and look at the population trends of Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Nigeria. The next, this century we're living in, by the end of this century, is going to be the African century, because that is where the planet's young people are going to be. And they are going to move around. And a lot of them will come to Europe, because that's what will happen. And they're starting to do it already, and no one quite knows. If you're in, I say to this, in Poland, you go along and talk to Poland, Polish young people, they're overwhelmingly Polish. You get off the plane in Poland, you are in Poland. Now, some of them are Ukrainians, because, but they sort of speak something a bit like Polish. But, you know, they look and are sort of part of that Central European Slavic genetic thing. You get off the plane at Heathrow, you're in a, a totally different genetic, much more complex base. You know, the colours of people are different. So I say to them in Poland, you know, go to Heathrow. You'll see a lot of people who are black, white, brown, whatever, and all sorts of combinations in the middle. You will look like that in a hundred years' time, because that is how it's going to be. And there are positive things from that. I mean, I don't think that's necessarily bad. Why should whiteness be a thing, or blackness be a thing, for that matter? But it's that's not the issue. What physical colour we have? The question is what we believe. You're listening to Delling Poll with my special guest, diplomat Charles Crawford. More in a moment. This is Delling Poll. A Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Dellingpole. You're listening to Dellingpole with my special guest, ex-British diplomat Charles Crawford, who's been explaining geopolitics to me and got some very interesting views, I think. Um, Charles, while we were just having coffee a moment ago, you were telling me about why you think the world is possibly a more <laughs> dangerous place than it has been in some time at least more confusing and, and volatile. Well, I think you've what you've got now, because of our iPhones and podcasts and all this great stuff, is a weird 
sort of, if I can use the word, dialectical contradictions, namely incredibly accelerating integration. Namely, you, your listeners can listen to this podcast in Australia, Venezuela, da da da, for free. And they will. And they will, which is really cool. Accompanied by accelerating disintegration namely people living in bubbles you know lunatics of every possible shape and size being able to organize themselves in ways that simply wasn't possible before you know weird nazi groups weird satanists weird people who believe in ufos all these people out there you know and fanatics of different shapes and sizes can organize now completely differently so you've got integration and disintegration happening simultaneously and for most of my life, I was, you know, we were brought up in the Cold War world where there was sort of the West and there was Russia and China and there were non-aligned countries and sort of people knew where they were. There was a sort of structure to the way we could think. But that, of course, was a bit anomalous for most of human history. It hasn't been like that. And of course, we're now, like as I said before, I think going back to a different sort of, you know, setup. In terms of just, you know, what are the sort of rules of the game? Not the international law rules of the game, but just the sort of way things work. Um, and I just wonder that, you know, I worry, frankly, that there could be, you know, if you look at the First World War as a war of mechanised sort of conflict between massive empires, which is really what it was. You know, the British Empire, the German Empire, the French Empire, the Turkish Empire. The only one of those empires, by the way, which is still around is the Russian Empire. It's called Russia. Russia is an empire. It's not a country. It's an empire. And that has yet to have its turbulent disintegration of the sort that other empires have had. Be all that as it may, that was the First World War. The Second World War was an ideological clash of, you know, the ultimate expression of mass. Did I talk about mass and velocity? Mass. Yes. This was mass on a big scale, massive armies, massive tanks, massive fleets of aircraft just crashing with each other all around the planet, but with an ideological collectivist methodology behind it. You know, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the two great collectivist socialist monsters, Hitler and Stalin, carving up Europe. And that's why I think Crimea is dangerous, because it's for the first time really since then that I can remember that one country in what we call Europe has said, looked across the fence at someone else's garden and said, thanks very much, I'll have that. Every border shift in Europe, really, since the Second World War has been done by negotiation peacefully. I cannot, I can't think of another, maybe apart from the skirmishes immediately after the Second World War, but once the Cold War got into its stride, borders were not changed by force. And that was the whole point of the Helsinki process, the OSCE process, the detente. I mean, that was how East and West came to have compromises leading to the collapse of communism. Borders were respected. We've gone back to where we started. So Crimea is very dangerous because it's one UN Security Council member with nuclear weapons grabbing someone else's land. And Syria is very dangerous because it's a sort of it's a space disintegrating and no one knows what should be there should syria be there or not no one seems to know you know are these lines on the map established by clever white foreign office diplomats and european diplomats a hundred years ago what do they represent and if you start saying well they don't represent much fine but how do you then move to something which is more legitimate and stable without chaos breaking out very difficult yes you seem to be agnostic uh, as to the the ideal solution because I was talking to you before we started recording yeah. um, about the the Kurdish state that the Kurds are trying to establish in northern Syria yeah uh, well I'm agnostic in the sense of why should I I mean I shouldn't care as a British person how other people organize their affairs that seems to me that's their problem um, what I'm less agnostic about is the consequences of chaos and what we should do about that but you know th there are some I mean, I don't know, look, you can look at this on this at so many different levels. What happened when the Cold War ended was that the divisions, the philosophical divisions in Europe were sort of solved between East and West. You know, we took down the Iron Curtain. You're too young, but I remember the days when you drove across Europe, you'd reach a point where there were watchtowers and barbed wire fences and people would be shot if they tried to cross from East to West. Yeah, I yearn nostalgically for the innocence of that era. Yeah, well, it was very innocent. No, it was, it was, it was in a way good because you sort of, 
you sort of knew where you were. The enemy was plain in view, whereas you don't know where you are now. Well, you, well, anyway, in Europe, we solved that, and that's led to huge gains in human rights and in values, and including in Russia. I mean, Russia is, you know, transformed. It was, I went there in 1985. I cannot tell you how desperate it was in Moscow then. There was no food. Well, can I, can I just pause you there yeah. and ask you, where are you on Putin? Where are you on the Russian threat? Because yeah. I, hear, I hear two points of view. One is is that actually, although obviously Putin is not Stalin, that he is, he is extremely yeah. dangerous, unpredictable, he cannot be trusted. There is no point conceding him, to him on sanctions or anything else because he is very dangerous. The yeah. other, other line is, hang on a second, We're, you've got to look at things from his point of view. Yeah. The European Union has been making uh, threatening noises, as far as he's concerned, about Ukraine, about territory that he would consider naturally Russia's, and we have been provoking him. Which is the right side? Crikey, well, that's another podcast. But, I mean, basically, they both might be right. It might be that there is... No, but it might be that he comes from a KGB tradition, that the sort of communist, dark Russian sort of... um, I don't know. One of the huge mistakes we made when communism ended was not to get Lenin out of Red Square. Lenin in Red Square. Lenin murdered and led to the deaths of millions of Russians, right? Yeah. Destroyed Russian And yet churches. the kids today think communism is a great idea that hasn't been tried properly. Well, that's just obviously stupid. But, but for the Russians, you've got someone there who really massacred your relatives. And that's like a sort of weird shrine. And, and this is very, very dark. You know, it's very, very um, weird that it's almost because they were so bad that you have to sort of rather respect them. Yeah, God, they were bad, but they were bloody good at being bad. And they were our bad. I mean, that, and their, the greatness of their badness makes us great, even though they killed our own people. So this is a very dark philosophy. And so when communism ended, there was no talk. I can tell you this for a fact. There was no talk in the, co- in the foreign office about demanding that as part of the deal, you take Lenin out of Red Square and bury him somewhere. And you take those villains who are buried in the Kremlin wall, these communists who murdered people, and bury them somewhere else. And you make a new symbolic start. And so Putin comes from the tradition which, you know, he knows perfectly well, he's a smart guy, that communism was stupid but he doesn't really sort of reject the dark side of Russian sort of nihilist collectivism. And does that mean you can't do deals with him? No. But I think you should only go so far in looking at the world from his point of view. Because, um, you know, because clearly as a diplomat, you should look at the world from other people's point of view. But what if the other person is paranoid? How far should you go in terms of respecting their paranoia? And there's a, I wrote a good piece on my website about this years ago called Animal, Vegetable or Mineral. Do you treat, do you look at Russia as a sort of animal, like the bear, which you mustn't provoke? Or do you look at it as... But, but it has a certain sort of consciousness, but it, it, it can only react in certain limited ways. Or do you look at it as a, a stone? Namely, if you kick it, it'll, it'll go down the road. It, it only acts if it's motivated. I mean, a lot of the arguments about what we should do about Putin are very sort of conceptually confused as to what you think you're dealing with. I mean, your question reflects that. Fair enough. You know, it's genuinely difficult. So I think you can do deals with Putin, but what bothers me is I don't quite know what he wants because if he thinks that ev- that everything Russia has ever owned is Russia's, yeah, and, and he's entitled to get that back at some point, then we've got a problem because that is simply Russian... It's the Russian Empire, going back to what I said before. It's the Russian Empire, and the limits of the Russian Empire are wherever it's got. So the and Baltic states... Kazakhstan, uh, the whole damn thing. Yeah. The whole thing, Finland, you know, they've been everywhere, you know, bits of going right down into Turkey. You know, that if he thinks that really, come on, guys, look, this is ours. It's come and gone, but really it's ours. And look at Poland. I mean, it's a great, I, I show on my, when I do my negotiation presentations, I show a picture of Warsaw, the, the old area of Warsaw in about 1910. There is the Russian Orthodox Cathedral. Poland gets independent. Poland at that point was, didn't exist. It, Warsaw was under the Tsarist Empire. Poland regains its independence. First thing they do, knock down the cathedral. 
this doesn't belong here. And that, that negotiation between Poland and Russia has gone on for the last 500 years, roughly. And it doesn't go away. So if Russia starts thinking that Warsaw is part of Russia, that is fundamentally, in the most guardian possible way, racist imperialism. That's just what that is. And I think for the Russians to insist that Ukrainians are owned by Russians is racist imperialism. Now, has the U European Union provoked Russia by trying to extend democracy to Ukraine? Well, maybe it has, but maybe Russia being provoked is a very serious problem, which is all about Russia's attitude to other people's freedom. So how far should you go to accommodate Russia being provoked? I don't know. You know, Russians say, look, we're being encircled. Look at the map, guys. Russia encircles everyone else. <laughs> this is this sort of... You know, it, it, it's, it's psychologically very complex because Russia is just so big. I'd love to sit and chat to Putin about is there a deal? Part of me wishes I'd been ambassador in Moscow to get a chance to talk to Putin's people about saying, look, I can understand that you feel unhappy about the modern world. But what is it you want, really? Because if you want territory, there's going to be real problems. The Kazakhs and so on, everyone's going to resist this now. You can't. The mobile phone genie is out of the bottle. You can't control these places even if you conquer them. The human cost will be unbelievable, even for Russians as well. Yeah. You know, by expanding, you might risk causing a lot of trouble in your own, you know, in Russia itself. Chechnya, for example. But is there a deal to be done about sort of spheres of influence? And part of me, in a funny sort of way, thinks that what the Russians really get cross about is they feel they're not respected yes now their economy is less than half the size of ours <laughs> and so if you look at where they are in terms of what they've done in the world apart from just bloody conquering everywhere in the northern hemisphere you might argue they've they've underperformed for the last thousand years nonetheless they are a big country so if putin can sit down with trump and do deals Maybe that gives Putin enough stature that he can therefore relax on some of this other ideological stuff. But there's a lot of ifs in that. We can but hope. Can we talk about the related subject of of Assad and Syria? Yeah. Again, I, I'm not sure what to think on this. Yeah. Is I I don't. Surely Assad is 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 there to stay because Putin wants him yeah. there to stay, and is it not better ultimately that there should be a kind of a bastard running Syria and keeping out the ISIS element, then that it descends into chaos. Well, that's that's you know going back to where we started. You know what the diplomats advise people. That sounds like a pretty pragmatic <laughs> approach. You know, no one likes pragmatism because it ends up sounding pretty cynical. But if the choice is between ISIS or a bastard, maybe you go with the bastard. And isn't that that true throughout the Middle East? I mean, I mean, but that's why you have Arabists because they say, listen, guys. Israel, you know, plucky Israel, but they've got a few problems. But on the other hand, there are certain realities here. And then people like you come along and say, look at all these Arabists, you know, because they're being, oh, in that sense, but, better the devil you know. But hang on a second. Arab Spring, it seems to me, sure. was, were, a lot of my neocon yeah. chums, I won't name names, sure. got very excited about the Arab yeah, Spring. so did I. They, yeah, they, we they all thought, did. Yeah, you silly fools. Yeah. The, oh, it's <laughs> a marvellous thing. Democracy is breaking out from, from, from Tunisia to Egypt. And, and isn't it wonderful we've got rid of that frightful fellow Mubarak? Well, that was a different matter. But, well, but I think the, this is what I was trying to say before, I think. I got wandered off. But when the Cold War ended, we solved the issue of European integration. You know, we broke down these walls. The next huge strategic problem in the world was, if you like, sort of cultural backwardness across the Middle East. You know, the absence of books, the, the, the fact that these national socialist grotty little dictators like Assad, like Gaddafi, like whoever, had been running these countries so badly for so long. There was a problem there of modernity which gets tangled up in Islam, of course, and in Arab identity and lots of other things. But the world didn't turn its eye from Europe to the Arab world, partly because of Bosnia, as it happened. I mean, there was just so much going on in that stupid corner of Europe. And while all that was happening, the ISIS, modern Islamist, radical thing was growing quite strongly at that point. So we've ended up in a very, very complex situation across the whole Middle East, which is basically a drama of modernity. How do you modernize these countries and make them work properly 
um, without can they be in any sense that we understand that in the West pluralist or are we doomed to have you know tough leaders modernizing on very very narrow terms and some places like Dubai and the Gulf states are much smaller so it's sort of different yeah but it's interesting when you look at borders Dubai is an incredibly open place if you want to vote in Dubai you cannot do that unless you are a genetic Dubaian if I become a Muslim you become a Muslim you marry a Dubai lady you still won't get to vote in Dubai they are saying our national identity right at the heart of it we set the rules they're very, very protective about that. So it's very open borders, but who sets the rules is the key thing. So if you say in the UK we're going to have open borders, the issue then is can the people who come in then become British and then set the rules? That's a different issue, you see. When you break it down, what is it you're exactly worried about? Anyway, going back to the Middle East, Syria is, you know, it's part of, like, Libya. It's a lot of these states where really there's simply no tradition of pluralism that we would understand. I mean, Poland, they had it. Russia, the communists, there was a tradition of pluralism. The communists have more or less wiped that out. So it's very hard to get a... The idea of the separation of powers, you see, the idea that the judge and the policeman and the fire station manager and the politician and the businessman all have their space, which the law respects. It's a very, very rare idea in the world. It may exist on paper, but there's very few countries where people really believe that's possible. Yeah. In many, most countries in the world, they simply don't believe it's possible. And if you've got a problem, you phone your cousin or have a word with a judge. That really doesn't happen in the UK. If it does, it's vanishingly rare. Whereas in other countries, it's vanishingly <laughs> rare for that not to happen. So this idea of modernity where you have law and you have rules which are sort of democratically endorsed and respected and flexible and those sorts of things, very hard to impose because culturally people don't believe it. So Syria is just a good example of things just breaking down because when you say is it better to have the bastard rather than ISIS, yeah. that's fine. But bastards running countries are simply storing up instability so that when the house crashes, it crashes even bigger. Mm. So one of the political dramas, and I wrote about this in Diplomat magazine, if anyone's interested, it's on the internet, is what do you do with bad leaders? If we said to Mugabe, if we said to Assad, if we said to Gaddafi, look, guys, come on, you've had a good run. We will give you a, a graceful exit strategy. There will be no war crimes trials. You've done all these, tortured all these people. That will be put on one side. We will give you a lot of money to go nicely. And we'll give you so much money that your people, your gangsters can go with them and live nicely in a gated community somewhere. They won't be prosecuted. They won't get shot. But you have to go. Is that a deal? Now, they might take that deal because, you know, people get tired of all this stuff. But there's no mechanism in our aid budget for offering bungs to dictators to leave. Because we say, well, hang on a minute, that's sort of encouraging dictators. So, in fact, the dictators stay on and then cause trillions of dollars of damage through migrants and chaos and disaster. So, in an odd way, the Hague, with its war crimes, uh, uh, and um, is actually doing the opposite of good. Well, you might. Well, it's, it's complex because you have to look at diplomacy over time scale. I think it's actually quite Im was it quite important in Bosnia to get the worst elements out of the local situation. Karadzic was there in Bosnia waving to NATO troops be long before, even after he was indicted, because the policy was don't rock the boat. But if these people there who are very, very destructive and fanatical aren't taken out, moderates can't really breathe. So I think there, there's a huge drama in how you run the modern world, namely, you know, I mean, I, and I say on my, going back to my courses I do, you know, I put up a picture of Assad and a picture of Gaddafi. Look at Gaddafi. He was a world-class bad egg, putting it politely, for a very long time. Yeah. You know, Lockerbie, supporting the IRA, all this stuff. He was just all over the place. Finally, after Iraq... His people came to London, talked to my good friend Mark Allen, ex MI6. He was MI6. He said, We'd like to, Gaddafi would like to talk about handing over his weapons of mass destruction. He doesn't want all this to happen. He'd like to sort of calm down a bit. 
Gaddafi negotiated with us and the Americans handing over his weapons of mass destruction. Gaddafi then did everything right. He went to Brussels. He calmed down. He stopped supporting terrorists. He did everything right. But then the Arab Spring comes along, and what do we do? Do we support Gaddafi and help him transit naturally? And Tony Blair, to be fair to Tony Blair, tried to help that. But then, of course, Tony Blair's a war criminal, so that, that apparently is bad. you know. So, so you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't in all this business. And what I think we've seen when you ask the question, is it better for these people to be there or not? The answer is maybe today, but maybe over the next 10 years that will turn out to be a disastrous mistake. Because when they crash, they will crash big. Charles Crawford, you've made international diplomacy look quite complicated it's, Not, it's complicated but it's very simple it's actually very simple what are the incentives in place over what time scale when you look at it from that point of view it's incredibly simple there's nothing difficult about all this really apart from trying to i think actually in this sense this is difficult trying to work out upon which time scale you're operating because democratic politicians have in the uk have a roughly two-year cycle American presidents maybe even a bit less because they're on four-year cycles and there's elections all the time in America. Someone like Putin, someone like the Chinese, someone like Assad can maybe operate on different timescales. But when you when you factor that in, it then becomes quite clear. What incentives are you setting up? Uh, are you rewarding bad behavior? Are you encouraging moderation? And if you don't encourage moderation and you reward bad behaviour in one way or the other, you will get more bad behaviour. That's sort of it, really. Charles Crawford, thank you very much.